thank you for the introduction. Um, it was every bit as good as one of Joy's introductions, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I, I want to mention for those of you who have come in perhaps a little late during the day that uh, this was intended as the keynote last night. Rhetorically, therefore, it was meant to lay out without a particularly compelling argument a series of areas of inquiry that I hoped would be picked up by speakers in the course of the day. It was meant to be proleptic. Uh, those thoughts have all been picked up, so now it's going to be resumptive. Uh, we, yeah, I just changed the tenses of the verb, exactly. Uh, but if you'll allow me the indulgence, on a couple of occasions I will just, as a sidebar, point out there are points of connection between what I've been trying to do with this and what some of the uh, speakers today have been um, expressing. All right, uh, also, just as the, the second um, sidebar, uh, this is not central to the work that was in the, the cattle book, um, but it gets tedious to keep rehashing the same ideas, so if you want to know more about cattle, buy the book. And uh, today is meant to be an extension into a new area, so it is uh, somewhat new work, and it is particularly to do with the, the, the question of hybridity in the Greek imagination. So it, it touches upon animals, but it's still very much work in progress. All right, the, the Greek imagination was populated with powerful symbols, sometimes nightmarish, sometimes comic, sometimes both, that reflected a cosmological battleground in which turmoil was an ever-present threat. And order, Zeus's order especially, was only a victory ever half won. Titans, hundred-handers, giants threatened at every corner to erupt from the earth and to reverse Zeus's triumph. Hesiod's cosmogony is nothing if not the story of the Argon as a cosmic principle. He may claim that all over the broad earth there are two kinds of errors, but the principle extends to the heavens as well, where succeeding generations of gods have been at war with each other. The Greeks were hardly unique or original in this respect. Marduk's victory over Tiamat and Gilgamesh's victory over Humbaba are only two examples of Near Eastern cosmological combats that clearly influenced Greek notions of cosmic order. One could imagine a Greek seeing in Marduk a sky god such as Zeus similarly laying his enemies low, just as the battle of men and monster virtually compels a syncretism of Heracles and Gilgamesh, or Heracles and Samson for that matter. In this area, perhaps more than any other, the Greeks participation in an Eastern Mediterranean oikumene, an Eastern Mediterranean and Near Eastern cultural oikumene is vividly on display. In a cosmos populated by men and monsters, or more accurately, in an anthropocentric pantheon with very human looking gods and monsters, the hybrid stands apart. Potentially quite recognizable, often very human looking, some hybrids, like this 6th century Laconian bronze, exhibit their hybridity almost as an afterthought. Depictions of the centaur Chiron, we saw this earlier today, will occasionally show him in Hymatian and otherwise dressed and coiffed like an aristocratic Kalos Kagathos, until we notice the appearance of a horse's hindquarters awkwardly stuck onto his back, as in this late archaic red figure Amphora from the Louvre. Annette, Annette had this in uh, the paper earlier today. In this late 6th century Kylix in Basel, Pholos reclines in sympotic elegance with Heracles, the very model of courtesy, his horse forelegs neatly folded beneath him in an equine equivalent of relaxation. Even the Minotaur with his bull's head is often depicted as if it were a man dressed like a shaman merely wearing a bull's mask as if the hybrid were more of a performance designed to comment on aspects of what remained fundamentally a human nature. The same point is made in this red figure depiction from around 340 of the infant minotaur displayed like baby Jesus on the virgin's lap, although Pacify was no virgin, emphasizing a very human nature in this depiction. These emphatically human hybrids aside, the hybridity of the creature is sometimes a not too subtle commentary on our fears and anxieties about aspects of human nature that seek a way of cultural expression, of finding a, a, a means of cultural expression, sexual anxiety being only the most obvious. Schiller is only one of a series of figures in a variety of cultures that forcefully juxtapose an alluringly female portion 
with a truly monstrous second half, usually, usually a lower half, to demonize, if not the whole woman, then at least the bits that men care most about. But ever present in most of these creatures is the insistence on a human aspect. In this respect, the hybrid is not just a monster. The creature from nightmares may have a primary appeal, as with the mass murderer of horror movies, we can indulge, control, and manage our fears as we contemplate the really scary monster. But the hybrid is likely to be less terrifying, yet more unsettling. In fact, the hybrid is an especially potent symbolic category because it embraces a spectrum of meanings and inhabits the more powerful places in our psychology. Rather than terrifying, it is unheimlich, unsettling. And as Freud claimed, the uncanny is that class of the frightening which leads back to, that, to what is known of old and long familiar. Put another way, that which is oddly familiar and at the same time unsettling and unfamiliar brings into sharp relief that which is ordinal and normative. Monsters prowl the, the borders, beyond the known is the unknown, beyond there be monsters. And even as we consider the incredible strength of that concept of the unheimlich, provoking Lacan's interpretation of angst and Kristeva's readings of objection, we're reminded that the unheimlich participates in a rather too simple binary opposition, a view in which people and experiences are either heimlich or not, but the hybrid is both. And as a sidebar, if I can read to you for a moment the description that goes with this image, available online, and there are some weird things when you use Google Image and go for hybrids. When you look this up, I, I didn't create this. It was created by a woman who has a, um, a website in which the description occurs, a wonderful collection of new species combining two or more animals. Super new species always welcomed, and you can upload your own hybrids. And in brackets it then says, generally won't place humans with animal heads, but the odd good slash interesting one will pass. And that gets exactly at the heart of the idea of hybridity. You don't want to get too funky, but funky enough to be just a little weird. The centaur is both wild, rude, hairy, uncivilized, brutal, driven by appetites and unbridled sexuality much of the time, yet it's also equally unmistakably familiar. And again, we saw another version of one of the Parthenon metopes earlier on. And here you can get the point once again that the torsos of the animal and the human are almost identical. In this case, we do have the face of the centaur showing that it's different from that of the young hero. But nevertheless, the degree of comparability from the waist up is really quite remarkable. It's only from the waist down that it becomes very, very different. On the Olympian pediments, the random state of preservation heightens this effect of this slight dissonance, this effect of unexpected recognition, by repeatedly offering us, as here, men raping women. You can see the hands tearing at the clothes and reaching for the breast, except these aren't men, they're centaurs. And the blade slipping into the chest over here is not a sacrificial blow aimed at an animal, nor is it a hunter's killing shot, it's a warrior's thrust at a foe in battle. Thus the confrontation, the disruption of a civilized feast, the ensuing chaos, the brawl, the assaults, the confusion, all the backstory that goes with the Lapids and the Centaurs, we experience not as a simple, excuse me, a simple triumph of human over beast, or civilized over uncivilized, or higher function over lower, it's none of those simple binaries. Rather, it's a tumult over which only the gods tower, serene and puissant. Humans are mired in the struggle, not triumphant. And when Alcibiades breaks in on Socrates and manages to disrupt the symposium, or later when Trimalchio's banquet ends not just with a dramatic performance of his own funeral, but with a fire brigade storming in and again breaking up the party, we find humans all too easily playing the role of the centaurs as disruptors of civilized life. The boundaries then between the hybrid and the human are extremely fuzzy. That fuzziness is sometimes expressed in the very image of the centaur. We're used to thinking of the figure of the centaur as clearly defined, human from the waist up, 
animal from the waist down, like this attic bronze from about 530. This permits another very clear binary distinction, again, one that I will suggest is false. Because besides the many representations that clearly employ the centaur's equine half to evoke a powerful unbridled sexuality, the fantasy of a man as a stallion, there, is also, there are also excuse me, a great many images that reflect the centaur as man, head to toe, with an equine half rather awkwardly grafted on, such as in this archaic terracotta from Boeotia, where the paint applied to the figure reinforces the line between the human and the horse. You can see he's human all the way back to the middle of the next half. The sexual confusion, or should we say polymorphism of the centaurs, is reflected in other ways. Pindar alludes to the centaur's origins in Pythian 2, 21-48, which tells of how Ixion's rude attentions towards Hera are answered by Zeus's creation of a cloud, Nephele, in the form of Hera, with whom Ixion has sex, the result of which is Kentauros, who in turn couples with the mares of Mount Pelion, producing, quote, that strange race, like to both parents, their mothers form below, above, their sires. They may, have, they may have their mother's form below, but they are decidedly more stallion than mare in their behavior. And this confusion created by their blending of bodies carries over most emphatically to their sexual organs. Here's a centaur from the Argos Museum. Sorry, this is a shot of mine from a few weeks ago, which is why it's so uh, fuzzy. Um, and as you can see, he's genitally quite human. The man with horse attached centaur may represent a threat or a confusion or an aberration, or then again, as in the case of the left Candy centaur, uh, he may not be particularly frightening at all. It's been suggested that the hole at the front there is actually where the human genitals were attached. And I think it is Chiron because of the wound on the leg that you can see on the left knee, but we can argue that later. But as a sexual creature, the centaur who is only human from the waist up, uh, only human from here up and horse completely below is now unmistakably a much greater threat to sexual order. Bestiality is added to rape as the explicit threat, as in this case of Nessos uh, stealing Dianyra. And this association with dimorphism and sexual confusion seems to attract into its orbit other episodes of sexual non-normativity. In other words, this becomes a kind of repository or a mental space for the Greeks to do a lot of thinking about what it is to be normal in sexual terms. For example, one of the favorite themes of archaic painters is the defeat of the Lapith Kyneus, who though invincible, invincible, is pounded into the earth by his centaur assailants. You can see him here in the middle of the side of this kylix, literally being stuffed into the earth as they drop boulders on top of him. They can't kill him, so he has to be buried alive. Well, why is this significant from the point of view of sexual hybridity and behavior? Kyneus began life as Kynus, a maiden pursued by Poseidon, who having had his way with her, granted her the boon of transforming her from a woman to a man and making her invincible. Like Tiresias, she experiences a sex change making Kyneus himself another kind of hybrid. So at a most obvious level, centaurs powerfully evoke threats to order in the form of sexual aggression and the subversion of sexual normativity. But anxiety is only one response to hybridity. Another can be fascination and the feeling that there can be a kind of beauty in mixing. We don't need to go to the Roman Satura to find a cultural appreciation of pleasing juxtapositions. In the Amargones, Philostratus the Elder, for example, gives a brief description of the female centaurs, the so-called Cantarides, which emphasizes the attractiveness of these hybrid creatures. He writes, how beautiful the Cantarides are, even where they, even where they are horses, meaning they're equine half. For some grow out of white mares, others are attached to chestnut mares, and the coats of others are dappled, but they glisten like those of horses that are well cared for. There is also a white female centaur that grows out of a black mare, and, my emphasis, the very opposition of the colors helps to produce the united beauty of the whole. 
Now, Philostratus's slightly creepy fondness for lady centaurs is a bit unsettling. It's a lot unsettling, in fact. But a Roman mosaic from the Bardo suggests that he was not alone. Here, the Cantarides flank of all people, Venus. So if the centaur blends natures, which is problematic, it can blend appearances rather prettily. You see the eyes done up with coal, the pert breasts, she's quite lovely. One might dismiss this as myth denuded of its archaic vigor, but a fairer judgment is that the archaic horse man and the imperial horse women are each deploying hybridity to frame somewhat contradictory ideas about mixing and about crossing boundaries. Transgression, after all, is thrilling, otherwise we wouldn't transgress. A further indication of how complex the response to hybridity can be is found in a passage that ought to figure more prominently in discussions of the centaur. And it is, in fact, the only passage I know of that explicitly addresses a part of the centaur myth that is surely central to its value as a cultural tool, namely, as a way of framing the relationship between men and horses as it pertains to the other kind of horsemen, namely human cavalry riders. In the Cyropedia, Xenophon has Cyrus's lieutenant, Chrysantas, address the question of whether the Persians ought to have cavalry or not. And Chrysantas speaks as follows. Now, the creature that I have envied most is, I think, the centaur, if any such thing ever existed. Able to reason with a man's intelligence and to manufacture with his hands what he needed, while he possessed the fleetness and strength of a horse so as to overtake whatever ran before him and to knock down whatever stood in his way. Well, all his advantages I combine in myself by becoming a horseman. At any rate, I shall be able to take forethought for everything with my human mind. I shall carry my weapons with my hands. I shall pursue with my horse and overthrow, overthrow my opponent by the rush of my steed, but I shall not be bound fast to him in one growth like the centaurs. Indeed, my state will be better than being grown together in one piece, for in my opinion at least, the centaurs must have had difficulty in making use of many of the good things invented by men. He doesn't specify what they were, going upstairs, I don't know. And how could they have enjoyed many of the comforts natural to the horse? I mean, grazing would be difficult for a start. But if I learn to ride, I shall, when I am on horseback, do everything as the centaur does, of course, but when I dismount, I shall dine and dress myself and sleep like any other human being. And so what else shall I be, what else shall I be than uh, a centaur that can be taken apart and put back together again? Again, I didn't create this. There's some weird stuff out there, really. The centaur functions as a, almost a thought experiment, as if Chrysantis were playing with Lego and saying, what happens if we put a man's torso onto a horse's body? Oh, too bad, no symposium for him. What would it be like if we adopted cavalry training? And given the overwhelming association between horsemanship and aristocratic performance, the use of the centaur to suggest limitations is a very interesting exercise. The blending of the two creatures produces a hybrid that is weaker than its parts, whereas the cavalry man has all the advantages of both his parts. It's a bit like a mullet hairdo, all business in front, all party behind, but taken as a whole, it's just a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, I was dared to put a photo of a mullet into this lecture, so I did. <laughs> Such mixtures are quite a bit less frightening than full monsters, Instead, they're examples of the uncanny, things that emphatically draw attention to themselves by virtue of playing off our expectations and our intuition. As a mode of thinking rather than a genre, the broad category of the hybrid adds emphasis. The unexpected fixes our attention. And this is one important aspect of cultural production. It shapes experience into narratives. Most of these are comfortably familiar, the pleasure of the sitcom or the courtroom drama, reassuring formulaic dramas that reshape experience into recognizably structured orderly forms. But the hybrid, bringing that pop of the uncanny, is like street art, where the surprise and the delight of the unexpected encounter focuses our attention. I, a week ago, literally turned around a corner in Athens and came across this, 
die, you masters of war, says this girl who has a heart painted over her chest. An example of the incredibly vivid street art existing in Athens right now, unfortunately, probably the uh, most significant aspect of the economic crisis artistically. An obvious question is, whence came this, this, this hybridity, this interest in the hybrid, this use of the hybrid? Well, an attention to the uncanny is, understand, is an understandable response when the Greeks were introduced to the rich repertoire of so-called mishfacen, or composite creatures that figured so prominently in the iconography of the Near Eastern empires encountered by the Greeks. One could even go back earlier to the Leuvenmensch of the Neolithic. But we are looking at more than a few isolated figures when we turn to the Near Eastern world, where a succession of complex hierarchical states both predated and were contemporary with the Greek city-states of the Archaic period. There, a rich tradition of lion men, man-faced bulls, fish men, and others were part of elaborate cosmologies that served as emblems for particular gods and demons associated with specific places. Here on uh, your left is an 8th, 7th century uh, griffin-headed deity in ivory from Urartu, the kind of object that could easily have been transported into the Greek world, as, for example, happened with this Assyrian bronze sheet with a sphinx. It's not very clear, sorry, but it's the figure right there that you might be able to see that turns up at Olympia as a luxury dedication in the 7th century. As allegories, these were deployed as visual evocations of the shifting power of various empires in the ancient Near East. For example, a recent study by Constance Gain has charted some of the shifting patterns in Neo-Babylonian iconography, and she remarks, Babylonian symbols of Marduk, also including his spade, dominate Neo-Babylonian iconography, supplanting motifs that were common in Neo-Assyria such as the winged lion and winged human-headed bovine that stands on all fours, which are totally absent in the extant Neo-Babylonian corpus. Her words, I suggest that such conspicuous omissions likely indicate that the Babylonians distanced themselves from their old enemies, the Neo-Assyrians, who frequently displayed the winged lion and human, uh, winged human-headed bull, especially at the entrance to their palaces and temples, end of quote. Here there may be an entire layer of familiarity and a discourse utterly opaque to us, but readily apparent to those who spoke the language of hybridity, so to speak. They knew the code. And if there were tussles over the meaning and the use of these images, we can only speculate on what this meant when Greeks were exposed to these images. When a 7th century Corinthian Aribolos shows a human, -headed, a human head grafted onto a lion, show you a drawing that makes it a little bit clearer, better seen in this drawing, what's the precise relationship between the Corinthian Aribolos that has this and the stone relief from Carchemish that it seems to echo? It was John Boardman who drew attention to this comparison. It doesn't replicate it slavishly. Does the original image lose all of its meaning in translation? Or does the Greek version operate within a totally different semantic field? where the precise divine meaning of the original has been replaced by something more attenuated, such as exoticism or wonder. We have to be careful here, trying to reconstruct the meaning of a symbolic language that itself was subject to shifts and which may have lost meaning as the symbols moved to new locations. Let's pursue this a little further. The Corinthian Aribolos just mentioned is a very peculiar hybrid and it looks forward to another similar one, the Chimera. I want to explore that figure for a moment and suggest one possible way of reading it. Canonically, the chimera is depicted as a creature with the body of a lion, the head of a goat jutting out of its back, and a serpent serving in place of a tail. The description of this goes back as early as Iliad 6, 179, in which Homer describes it in his explanation of the deeds of Bellerophon. First, Yobati sent him, Bellerophon, away with orders to kill the chimera, none might approach. A thing of immortal make, not human, lion fronted and snake behind and goat in the middle and snorting out the breath of the terrible flame of bright fire, he killed the chimera, obeying the portents of the immortals. And here you see Bellerophon on Pegasus fighting the chimera. Now, it's certainly an example of a hybrid beast, 
but it is considerably more unsettling than the centaur. Its hybridity is more purely monstrous, a feature clear from the very early references to it, even as far back as he sees Theogony. He explains its birth. She, Echidna, bore the chimera, who snorted raging fire, a beast great and terrible and strong and swift-footed. Her heads were three. One was that of a glare-eyed lion, one of a goat, and the third of a snake, a powerful dracon. But chimera was killed by Pegasus and gallant Bellerophon, but she also, in love with Orthos, mothered the deadly sphinx and the Nemean lion. Now, the chimera's name might mean winter air, and there may be an astrological significance since it was the constellation Capricorn, the goat, whose rising foretold winter. But this aside, the locality always associated with the myth is Lycia, where Bellerophon and Pegasus were certainly into, excuse me, but Bellerophon and Pegasus were certainly integrated into the cycle of myth that was centered on Corinth. Bellerophon is the son of Glaucus, king of Corinth, and images of the Pegasus essentially served as an emblem for the city as the wide distribution of Pegasoi in Greece and the Western colonies attests. The city was famous for the Pyrene fountain where Pegasus set foot, and so we might want to parse the chimera in a Corinthian context for an allegorical meaning subsequently lost. If Pegasus is Corinth, what's the chimera? Now, the three elements of the chimera, lion, goat, and serpent, are extremely suggestive in terms of North Peloponnesian locations. The dominant element is the lion, of course, and in fact the monster was the mother of the Nemean lion, so an association with Nemea suggests itself even as early as Hesiod. The second element is the serpent attached to the lion, and any mythological reference to a snake or Draco is likely to evoke either the dragon slain by Apollo at Delphi or the Lenaean Hydra, a multiform monster killed by Heracles. Lerna lies to the southwest of Argos on the Gulf, and was actually said by Strabo to lie in the Argeia, or the Argive territory. So two of Corinth's, Corinth's nearest neighbors and rivals, Nemea and Argos, could, in the language of monstrosity, have been framed in a Corinthian setting as lion and serpent. Keeping to the Peloponnesian setting, we now look for a location evoked by the goat. The key is phonetic. The stem Aig is used in a variety of formulations involving goats, Aigagros, wild goat, Aigeos, goat-like, Aigalates, goat herd, and of course, the two best known, Aigis, the goat skin shield of Athena, and the basic word, Aix, Aigos, goat. As a toponym, the term is especially associated with another Corinthian neighbor, namely Sicyon, located here on the north, uh, at the top of the map. Herodotus recounts that after the Sicyonians rejected the tribal reforms of Cleisthenes, they returned to their old names, Hilles, Dimonati, and Pamphiloi, and added a fourth, Aegialeus, after an early king, Aegialeus. And a variety of sources from Homer to Pausanias recall that the coastal strip of the northern Peloponnese was formerly known as Aegialeia, quite possibly a very ancient toponym, since as Yanis Lolos points out, the same toponym occurs in Linear B tablets from Pylos and Thebes. Now, the association with Aegialeia and Sicyon wasn't just a distant memory. Pausanias could describe features in the cultic landscape in the Agora of the second century city as follows. Next is the sanctuary of persuasion. This too has no image. The worship of Pytho was established among them for the following reason. When Apollo and Artemis had killed Pytho, they came to Aegialeia to obtain purification. Dread came upon them at the place now called Phobos, fear. They turned aside to Carmanor in Crete, and the people of Aegialeia were smitten by a plague. When the seers bade them propitiate Apollo and Artemis, they sent seven boys and seven maidens as supplings to the river Sithas. They say the deities were persuaded by these, came to what was then the citadel, and the place they first reached is the sanctuary of patho, or persuasion. So even in Pausanias' time, the notion that Sicyon had a more ancient identity, Aegialeia, was still current, in much the same way as every Greek recognized that Ephura was the epic name for Corinth, or that Holy Pytho was the epic name for Delphi. So an Aig toponym can connect with Sicyon, suggesting the goat as a suitable emblem. Now, it may be objected by the philologists still awake that Aegialeus and Aegialeus are more likely to be formed from the word Aegialos, meaning beach, as in the modern Greek, periali. But false etymology I don't think is a problem here. 
When the Sicyonians adopted the tribal name Aegialais, they linked it to an eponymous king, Aegialaios, not to the fact that they inhabited the seashore. So false etymology really doesn't weaken the case for an emblematic goat. What makes Sicyonian connections attractive here is that there are persistent legends whose historicity is tenuous, to be sure, of a period of Argive control of Sicyon, and in fact, more broadly speaking, in the late Bronze Age, the material culture of the regions reflects a Corinthia gradually pulling away from the influence of the Argolid. Argive influence increased again in the Archaic period, and when Sicyon joined the Argives against Sparta in the Mycenaean Wars, Lolos concludes that the emancipation of Sicyon from Argos came from the rise of tyranny and the coming of Cleisthenes to power. And at pretty much the same time that, the, that Cleisthenes was asserting Sicyon's independence in the second quarter of the sixth century, a move that will hardly have inspired feelings of security in neighboring Corinth, Corinthian potters were producing vases that lumped Sicyon, Argos, and Nemea into a single monster, being defeated by the local Corinthian hero. And it is at this time that the Corinthians began minting the silver pegasoi that carried their emblem. So, these are not cosmological battles. These are local, regional rivalries played out iconographically, employing animal emblems as the vocabulary of that rivalry. This was something of a Sicyonian speciality. When Cleisthenes of Sicyon changed the tribal names of Sicyon in the early 6th century, the, na the names he gave the tribes were Hiatai, the boar men, Oniatai, the donkey men, and Koiriatai, the piggy men. Remarkably, these names didn't catch on. And not for the first time, demonizing backfired. Not only did the Sicyonians reassert their older Dorian names, but even more telling, in the late fifth century, they began minting a plentiful supply of silver coins, employing as their emblematic animal, the chimera. They actually took on this designation, which I'm arguing begins with Corinthian potters trying to demonize them. I've been arguing for a highly local significance to this particular hybrid, suggesting that the chimera grows out of regional rivalries in the northern, northeastern Peloponnese. But the agonistic context of archaic Greek culture was not limited to the epicoric level. In a Mediterranean world where different groups were constantly, that should be read in a Hollywood voice, you know? In a Mediterranean world <laughs> where different groups were constantly interacting, sorry, with power shifting from center to periphery, with negotiations between Greeks and Phoenicians, indigenes to the west, Greeks and well-established civilizations to the east, the role of the hybrid in modulating relationships between different groups who potentially read the same image in different ways is especially significant. So I want to explore now not a local version but an international version of hybridity in the Greek setting. Take the Hellenistic historian Barossus, a Babylonian priest who in the early Hellenistic period wrote in Greek. He describes a curious Babylonian sea monster named Oanes. Fish-bodied, below its fish head, it also had the head of a human, while joined to its tail were human feet. This fish man spoke with a human voice, and when he spoke, his words were worth hearing. <coughs> Excuse me. Oanes was accustomed to pass the day among men, but took no food at this season, and he gave them an insight into letters and science and arts of every kind. He taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, and he explained to them the principles of geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect the fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which could tend to soften manners and humanize their lives. From that time, nothing material has been added by a way of improvement to his instructions. The Oani's figure is, in fact, quite well known in a variety of Near Eastern settings, where he's more properly termed the fish Apkalu, and Mehmet Aliatach uh, at Bryn Mawr notes that Apkalu is the main supernatural, the Apkalu is the main supernatural creature appearing in the art of Ashur Nasipal. And the fish-cloaked Apkalu also figures in seals from Uruk, recording financial tr transactions guaranteed by the temple. These figures have a long Babylonian history and are identified as the seven sages of the Apsu, or the holy carp, the one one of whom is known in the Uruk tablets as Uan. He also appears in monumental form at Pasagadai. It's a little bit uh, dark, I'm sorry, but if you look at the figure on the right of this monumental gateway going into Palace S, uh, you can see a figure who's wearing either the fish skin or the fish cloak over his legs. 
at Pasargadai where the Achaemenids appropriate his power to legitimize their rule. Barosus Oanes is surely a later instantiation of this same figure. The hybrid Oanes is a culture hero, an unexpected role in some ways foreshadowing the role of Chiron in training Achilles. Even more curious is the gist of Oanes' message to humankind. There was a time in which there existed, and I'm continuing the, uh, the quote from Barosus, in which there existed nothing but darkness and an abyss of waters, wherein resided most hideous beings, which were produced of a twofold principle. There appeared men, some of whom were furnished with two wings, others with four, and with two faces. They had one body but two heads, the one that of a man, the other of a woman, and likewise in their several organs, both male and female. Other human beings were to be seen with the legs and horns of goats. Some had horses' feet, while others united hind quarters of a horse with the body of a man resembling in shape the hippo centaurs. Bulls likewise were bred there with the heads of men and dogs with fourfold bodies terminated in their extremities with the tails of fishes. Horses also with the heads of uh, dogs, men with other animals and the heads and bodies of horses and tails of fish. In short, there were creatures in which were combined the limbs of every species of animals. In addition to these animals, fishes, reptiles, serpents and other monstrous animals which assumed each other's shape and countenance. Uwani's the hybrid creature instructs men in the history of hybrid creatures. His message seems to be an interpretatio graica of Babylonian cosmology, and in fact, much the same content of Owani's lesson to humans, in Barosus, can be paralleled in the Enuma Elisha's description of Tiamat's creation of monsters. She deployed serpents, dragons, and hairy hero men, lion monsters, lion men, scorpion men, mighty demons, fish men, bull men, bearing unsparing arms, fearing no battle. Her commands were absolute, no one opposed them. Eleven indeed, on this wise, she created. Now, since this was recounted in the Enuma Elish, every year in Babylon at the New Year celebration of Marduk's cosmological victory, it's hardly surprising that Barosus, a priest in Babylon, was familiar with the story. Barosus' account of hybridity finishes with this claim. All of these phenomena were preserved as delineations in the Temple of Bel at Babylon thereby pointing to the visual impact of Near Eastern iconography. Barosus, a bilingual medium, is explaining these images to a Greek audience, in effect trying to educate them. Ja thus, the Babylonian priest writing Greek, hybrid anyone? Presented to a Greek audience the Babylonian hybrid figure of a fish man as the source of civilization, and then outlined a Babylonian cosmos populated with similar creatures, divinities and demons, to one audience monsters to another. These creatures were visible to those who encountered Eastern art, although their specific or general meanings were surely opaque. One can barely unpack the layers of hybridity here, but what emerges from this mise en abime is the power of the hybrid to instantiate the middle ground in which cultures speak and misspeak to each other. Antigone Zornazzi has recently suggested that the appropriation and reappropriation re of these figures between Babylon, Assyria, and Achaemenid Persia is a discourse fundamentally concerned with the legitimacy of kings and dynasties. It's unlikely, however, that the Greeks exposed to this grasped much of the significance of these dynastic and cultural conflicts. Did they care whether Babylonians were dismissing Assyrian claims? Or if Achaemenids were appropriating Babylonian deities? I, I doubt it very much. So as with much of the cultural flow from west to east, we're forced to distinguish symbols and their meaning, their meaning. The medium is not the message. Hybridity in the setting of imperial iconography and in relation to imperial power recurs at the other end of the chronological spectrum. I've taken us outside of Greece to the Near East. I want to take us now a little bit later and again outside of Greece. And again, exploring this will highlight the difference between Greek practices of the archaic and classical periods with those of their imperial neighbors, and also with Greeks under imperial Roman rule. By the time of the Roman Empire, the centaur was one of many types of oddities and curiosities collectively called mirabilia, miraculous things, the control of which illustrated the emperor's reach. The Romans collected wonders in much the same way as they collected kingdoms. In the second century, Phlegon of Trales, himself an imperial freedman of Hadrian, reported this. Above Sauni in Arabia, a hippo centaur was discovered high up in a mountain which is full of a marvelous drug. The drug is named after the city, and it is regarded as the keenest and deadliest of poisons. 
The king captured the hippocentaur alive and sent it with other gifts to Caesar in Egypt. It lived on meat but was unable to endure the change of climate and died. So the prefect of Egypt had it preserved and sent to Rome. At first it was displayed in the palace, having a face more savage than a human's and hairy hands and fingers, and its lungs were connected to its forelegs and stomach. It had the hard hooves of a horse and yellowish hair, even though its skin had been blackened by the preservation process. It was not as big as some writers have recorded, but also not so small. In the aforementioned city of Sani, there was also said to be, a, to be other hippocentaurs. If someone doesn't believe the one sent to Rome was real, he can investigate it. For the preserved one is kept on the property of the emperor, as I said before. So there. He doesn't say so there. Like the exotic animals and the tableau vivant, various world's fairs in the 20th century used to capture the exotic, to tame the primitive and to display it to those of superior culture, Mirabilia represented the reach of imperial knowledge systems to the farthest edges of the empire. A hierarchy of imperial knowledge, the more recherche, the better. The Arabian centaur illustrated the reach and the power of the empire that was able to acquire it. Flagon's account comes after a list of other curiosities, a head found in Messenia three times normal size, bodies in Dalmatia with ribs more than 11 cubits. I fished out this photo for you of an actual centaur skeleton. Teeth from Pontus over a foot long and brought up by earthquakes in the time of Tiberius, transferred to Rome. And from there, we rapidly move on to other skeletons found in chance excavations measuring dozens, if not hundreds of cubits. And then curious births. A woman giving birth to a monkey, a woman born, a baby born with the head of Anubis, a fetus with two heads, and a list of women who gave birth to prodigious numbers of children, one woman producing 24 offspring in four confinements. Among these oddities, what tribute could be more fantastic than a centaur? It seems fitting that according to Pliny, the Emperor Claudius recorded the birth of a centaur in Thess Thessaly, and Pliny says that he himself saw another hippocentaur from Egypt, which died and was preserved in honey to be shipped to the emperor. I juxtapose the Chimera in the Peloponnese, Oanes, the Fishap Kalu, and Phlegon Center to locate these hybrids within a much larger discourse on hybridity. What are the Greeks thinking about when they tell stories about and paint vases with these creatures? They may have borrowed hybridity from older Near Eastern cultures, and we could apply a, diffu a diffusionist model, but to what end? Is a Thessalian centaur an Assyrian Lamassu reappropriated? As Mark Bloch used to say, origin is not explanation. There are countless hybrid figures the Greeks could have adopted, and the question is what these figures do for the Greeks, not just uh, their antecedents. Hybridity is popular with the Greeks as opposed to their imperial neighbours, partly, it seems to me, since it represents a response to the constant interaction of Greek, excuse me, of cultural groups with each other, especially cultural groups with different linguistic backgrounds. The hybrid foregrounds the mental operation of categorization, as Greek meets indigene across the Mediterranean, as Phoenician shadows Greek both in the West and in the East, and perhaps in Greek ports, there is a constant pressure to deploy binary categories structuring the world around us and them. Colonizer and local, Euboean and Sickle, Achaean and Trojan, Greek and Phoenician, the experiences of the archaic period are insistently structured around oppositions, polarities, and fierce similarities. Trojans and Greeks look and sound like each other, and so are the deadliest of enemies. At the same time, the archaic period is also the time when the Greeks adopted an alphabet from the Phoenicians. And the earliest instances at Almina, at Pithecusae, and now at Ipoio, at Methone, from which that cup comes, in northern Greece, keep underscoring that the most particular instance of hybridity, namely Greek writing, the fusion of Greek language with Northwest Semitic script, occurs in the setting of trade communities where people of different groups rub shoulders and conduct their intercourse. One form of that intercourse results in the truest hybrid, the child with a Greek and a Phoenician parent. Thoroughly bilingual and capable of writing one of the two languages, in Phoenician script, why not the other? Colonial encounters as expressed in the cycle of Heracles myths, put him in the Western Mediterranean fighting the locals and introducing Greeks to the heathens, like the Romans, show how psychologically potent contact with non-Greek cultures was for the Greeks. Hybridity gives shape to that experience by creating a mental space, space in which the distinctions between different groups, ethnicities, 
people and their cultures can be broken down, reassembled, rendered comprehensible, turned into narrative, demonized, ridiculed, treated any other way. And the hybrid is useful epistemologically in the context of the colonial encounter. If there must be an argon, let it be with something that at first glance is like us, and at second glance deserves to be defeated without mercy. This bifurcation, the similar and the dissimilar, is expressed in the body of the hybrid and also expressed iconographically. Most commonly, the figures face each other, but we, the viewer of the scene, see it usually at 90 degrees to the confrontation. We're therefore invited to see the bifurcation fully, man versus centaur, which within the composition is actually man versus something quite man-like, but from without is man versus monster, hoarseness grafted weirdly onto the man. So our experience of the centaur allows us, in fact, forces us to engage more richly, more insistently, and more fully with the conflict. Again, Freud's exposition of the Unheimlich offers a pointer. He expanded the notion of the Unheimlich by noting that many literary examples involved doubling, and he expressed it this way. These themes are all concerned with the phenomenon of the double, which appears in every shape and in every degree of development. Thus, we have characters who are to be considered identical because they look alike. As the man confronts the man horse, he sees another man, and then the horse. It is the aha moment of this recognition, misrecognition, that is so potent. The figurines similarly force a confrontation expressed in our response to the hybridity. Now, unlike the full monsters of alien genus, totally unlike us and purely threatening, the hybrid can attract, can express a kind of humanity, but it is its hybridity that foregrounds an unsettling dialectic of similar and threatening. The siren is beautiful woman, and then monster below, a suitable representation of man's greatest fears, namely women's sexuality. The centaur is human but bestial, a fitting representation of man's second greatest fear, men's sexuality. The trouble with thinking in the binary terms I'm suggesting is that it produces a mechanistic view of the world, and that is exactly what the exuberance of Greek art avoids. Humor and irony remain closely connected with the deployment of hybridity as a vehicle for exploring what is odd, challenging, or threatening. For example, a red figure crater in Boston by the Neobid painter depicts a scene of Neolius abducting uh, Thetis. Various Nereids try to rescue Thetis. Thetis. Uh, hang on, I have a pointer. I can use it. I'm a grown-up. I can do this. Here we go. You can you see one of the, uh, the Nereids trying to save uh, Thetis by threatening Peleus with a very, very challenging-looking uh, fish. And at the side, and we're going to come around to this figure in a moment, you'll see there is Chiron looking on. From the side here above the handle, you can just see the human side of him, but he's carrying this stick, which is sort of emblematic of Chiron and some of the other centaurs, and you can just see his horse's backside uh, as he looks on from there. And if we move around, the handle is sort of up here. If we move around towards the back, you can see Chiron more clearly here, looking pretty human, and then a bit horsey at the back. We find further this distraught young woman uh, running away while this handsome youth looks on. You can see he's well-robed and he's beardless. Uh, and uh, the sexual aggression of the other side of the scene is somewhat muffled, not only by his cloak, but also by the fact that he's brandishing what looks to me to be a very limp noodle. <laughs> I'm showing you this because I think the scene's a joke. It's a, a comic book version of the sexual threat. And it reminds us that if the uncanny can cause us to look twice, it can also cause us to smile twice. Chiron frequently approaches his protege Achilles with hairs hanging from his staff, hairs as in rabbits, the gift suitable for an Erastes wooing his Eromenos. Again, a witty and lighter take on an established set of forms and images. So, this should be a little confusing by now. If hybrids can be bringers of civilization and threats to it, if they can be deadly serious and comic relief, is there anything in common to all the uses to which hybridity can be put? Rhetorically, we've gone from doing an Aristotelian exercise of breaking this into its categories, and now we're going platonic. In the world of forms, is there hybrid? Well, yes, and it is a fascination with boundaries, their significance, and the question of what purpose they serve. For example, in the poetics, Aristotle is concerned with clarifying the constituent features of a genre. What makes poetry poetry? 
Well, for Greek poetry, this is bound up with the question of metre and the fitness of particular metres to particular genre. But the opposition of particularity is medley, the hybridization of genre and metre. And interestingly, when Aristotle turns his attention to this medley, once again, the centaur rears its ugly head. Similarly, if a man makes his representation by combining all the metres, as Chiron did when he wrote his rhapsody, The Centaur, a medley of all the metres, he too should be given the name of poet. On this point, the distinctions thus made may suffice. Borders and boundaries, not poetic distinctions, but actual borders and boundaries, are a preoccupation of the archaic and classical periods in Greece. The countryside of Attica, for example, is dotted with literally thousands, not dozens, literally thousands of Horos inscriptions, separating farms from each other, marking the temenae of the gods and the land owned by a deem or a theasos. Here's the Horos of the Agora from the Piraeus. This marker, for example, from the Vari farmhouse is a Horos inscription that may even diagrammatically evoke the boundary of two properties. Here's one Omicron, Here's another. Here's the row, possibly written retrograde. Uh, Horus inscriptions occur in many varieties, but sometimes simply O-R or O-R-O-S, vari variations. This is definitely a Horus inscription. Uh, but it's a particularly interesting one because it seems to evoke the boundary of two properties with a gully in between, as if this is one property, here's another, and here's the divider between them. This could be both symbol and word, a kind of Greek reverse of the movement from pictogram to syllabary. Treaties defining borders frequently cite the phrase hushudore as the water flows, showing that watercourses, rivers, gullies, and torrents are useful natural boundary markers, as we seem to have there. And it's while carrying Dianaira across a boundary, the river Oenus in Aetolia, that Nessus the ferryman, the one supposed to help you negotiate boundaries, makes the fateful decision to try to rape her, precipitating the wrath of Heracles, his own death, and ultimately, through the gift of poison, the death of the hero. Heracles, as Tina Salloway has shown, is frequently associated with places that are known for waterworks, human manipulation of the natural environment through drainage and canalization, and the centaur's association with a natural watercourse and the danger of crossing it sees the centaur once again serving as a metaphor for nature in one of the oldest binaries known to us, Fusis versus Nomos. Note also that rape is another form of transgression. As constructed by the Greeks, as Edward Harris has shown, it's a violation of one man's property by another. And so situating Nessos's violation at a river crossing represents a double threat. Greek uses of hybridity, notably in the figure of the centaur accordingly, occupy some places in common with the Assyrian, Babylonian, and Achaemenid states to the east, and in other ways are quite separate and distinct. One particularly novel development of the use of, the hy of hybridity is in formal philosophical discourse, and I'm going to say a few words on that and then finish. In philosophical discourse, where we can see some of the, more of the core resonances at work, in Book Nine of the Republic, Socrates and Glaucon are discussing the integration of the soul and the ways of determining the pernicious effects of contradictory tendencies towards injustice and passion, creating the prospect of an unjust man who seems outwardly perfectly just. And after a series of investigatory questions, Socrates introduces a kind of thought experiment designed to allow the interlocutors to see the dangers of regarding the soul as composite rather than integrated. Socrates says, and this is Book 9588C, it was, I believe, averred that justice is profitable to the completely unjust man who was reputed just. Socrates urges Glaucon to have a conversation with this unjust fraud. How, he said? Well, by fashioning in our discourse a symbolic image of the soul that the maintainer of that proposition may see precisely what it is he was saying. What sort of an image, he said. Well, one of those natures that the ancient fables tell of, said I, that, as that of the chimera or Scylla or Kerberos and the numerous other examples that are told of in many forms grown together in one. Yes, they do tell of them. Mould then a single shape of a manifold and many-headed beast that has a single ring of heads of tame and wild beasts and can change them and cause to spring forth from itself all such growths. Now he goes on to propose imagining a man who has the nature of a lion and a man, but with the former concealed within the latter, so that this hybrid is not one of outward appearance, he looks like a man, but of inner nature, since he has the appetites of an animal. This, of course, has been a potent th uh, thread in Western thought, often with animals being unfairly associated with the worst tendencies of humans, even as we also 
tend to project some of our better qualities onto them as well. But Socrates' casual reference to the hybrids of myth calls attention to the fact that the core problem here is mixing, as in the discussion of poetic styles in book three makes clear. No pantomimes, no presentation of images and performances and rhythms that detract from severe simplicity will be tolerated. Pur purity is threatened by any suggestion of mixing. To take this one step further though, these hybrids represent not just an ethical problem demonstrating the dangers of miscegenation, but also an epistemological problem. Did they ever exist? Xenophon was ready to express doubt, and for someone interested in the true nature of the universe like Lucretius, the question such hybrids pose is simply, if they never existed, how can we be conscious of them? Lucretius tackles this head on in book two, using hybrids such as the centaur and the chimera as counterintuitive examples. If things didn't have a ratio by which they fit together, you could see all such things, excuse me, all the time, quorum nil, fieri manifesto mes, but of course, that's not the case. So how do their images come about? Well, in book four, he explains, certainly no image of a centaur comes from one living, since there never was a living thing of this nature, but when the image of a man and horse meet by accident, they easily hear at once, on account of their very fine nature and thin texture. And since they're carried about with velocity because of their extreme likeness, any given one of these fine images easily bestirs our mind by a single impression, for the mind itself is itself thin and wonderfully easy to move. In a somewhat similar vein, concerned with sensation, Diogenes Laertius offers a range of modes by which we perceive. And this too includes the hybrid as a category of thinking. By incidents or direct contact have come our notions of sensible things. By resemblance, notions whose origin is something before us, as the notion of Socrates, which you get from his bust, while under notions derived from analogy come those which you get by way of enlargement, like that of Tidius or the Cyclops, or by way of diminution, like that of the pygmy. Of notions obtained by transposition, creatures with eyes on the chest would be an instance, while the centaur implies those reached by composition. What I'm suggesting is that hybridity is not just a theme or a genre, it's in fact a mode of thinking, and an extremely powerful and useful one. What emerges from this examination of hybridity? is perhaps more of a hodgepodge than the simple binary of two or three forms merged, or the simple opposition of heimlich and unheimlich. It's an example of a phenomenon that at various times in Greek culture can be allegorical, as in the Sicyonian chimera, at times an expression of anxiety, as in the Thessalian centaurs, a link to a broader repertoire of symbols, as in Hesiod's use of Eastern cosmologies, or even as the middle ground between cultures, as in Barossus' account of Oanes, the fish cloaked Apkalu. Equally, the hybrid offers the Greeks the space to explore boundaries and transgression in inventive ways, mythologically through Nessus and philosophically in Plato's application of hybridity to the problem of human appetites. Hybridity offered a rich and varied mode of thinking for the Greeks, producing creatures that it would seem continue to surprise, delight, and truly scare us today. Thank you.